Hello, good afternoon. My name is Garrett McQueen. I'm the Director of Artist Equity for the American Composers Orchestra, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's professional development session on the topic of score and part preparation featuring Manly Romero and Philip Rothman. The music that you and I were just enjoying was an excerpt from a work titled Volgar by one of our most recent earshot featured artists, Adelia Faizulina. If you'd like to check out that full performance, just hop over to ACO's YouTube page and check it out alongside our many other bits of content. Special thank you and shout out again to composer Adelia Faizulina. So today's session is part of Earshot, the nation's first systemic program for building relationships between orchestras and composers through orchestral readings, collaboratory fellowships, consortium commissions, and professional development. Earshot expands the definition of American orchestral music to ensure a vibrant and inclusive future. Earshot is a program of American Composers Orchestra completed in partnership with the American Composers Forum, the League of American Orchestras, and New Music USA. Composers for our Earshot readings are selected through an open call with no fee or age limit. We are delighted to welcome many of them here today. All of our Earshot professional development sessions are also open to the public. For the full schedule and list of topics, please visit us at AmericanComposers.org. Today's webinar on the topic of score and part preparation is a part of our larger effort to help composers engage orchestras in a way that sets up all parties for success. There are many aspects of score and part preparation that have been standardized across the industry, and it's very important for composers, both emerging and well-established, to stay up to date on those guidelines so that the engagement with performing ensembles can be as smooth and efficient as possible. So in the invitation for this webinar, you should have received two vital resources. The first is an online resource called Scoring Notes. The online resource Scoring Notes has become a one-stop shop for many composers seeking advice with articles and guidance on everything from paper sizing to binding, um, even suggestions of printers and other hardware. The second is what we all refer to as MOLA guidelines as a result of many hours of discussion and collaboration among many of America's orchestra librarians. The Major Orchestra Liaisons Association has published official guidelines to help composers and publishers fit within the agreed upon parameters most utilized in the field today. If you uh, didn't get those or can't get your fingers on them, I'll drop uh, links to both of those resources in the chat here in a few minutes. Just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. I'm sure uh, you may have many questions or comments that come to mind over the course of this presentation. So if you wouldn't mind offering those using the Q&A function here on Zoom as we go along, that will be great. And we'll get to as many of those questions as time allows. If you'd like to come on screen to ask your question directly to today's presenters at the end of today's presentation, feel free to use the hand raise function here on Zoom and we'll bring as many of you on screen as we can as time allows. As a follow-up to this session, we will be offering materials for your review, uh, which will be available at a later date, so be sure to check back and stay tuned for those. I'll also be offering a survey in the chat uh, at the conclusion of today's presentation, so if you wouldn't mind clicking that link when it appears and offering your feedback, it would be much, much appreciated. And with that, I'd like to introduce to you today's featured speakers. Dr. Manley Romero's career in performance life librarianship began in 1990, 1988, when he became the first library intern and youth orchestra librarian at the San Francisco Symphony. Manley has earned a DMA in composition from the University of Michigan, and in addition to his role at the American Composers Orchestra, he uh, is the performance librarian at the Manhattan School of Music, the New York Pops, and personal librarian for Pinkus Zuckerman, among many other artists. Welcome here to the digital stage, Dr. Manley. Romero. Hi there, Manly. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hello. And I'd also like to uh, welcome to the stage Philip Rothman. Philip Rothman is a Juilliard trained composer and orchestrator with more than two decades of experience preparing quality materials for professional clients in the music industry. Philip's music 
preparation firm NYC Music Services provides music services to professional clients and has worked on thousands of projects ranging from simple transpositions to large opera productions and runs the notation Central Marketplace, which sells fonts, utilities, templates, pub plugins, and sheet music. Philip is the editor and principal contributor to Scoring Notes, a website and regular podcast that covers music notation software and related technology. Welcome, Philip Rothman. Hello. Hey, Garrett and Manley and assembled guests. Thanks for that introduction. Nice to be with you. Absolutely. Well, I'll let the two of you take it away. Thanks so much. Well, thank you so much, Garrett. Um, I think uh, we decided, Philip, that I'd, I'd start off talking about librarianship and then lead into uh, uh, your uh, talking about digital things. Sounds great. So uh, I wanted to start just by talking about what a performance librarian or orchestra librarian is. Uh, it may not be a familiar uh, role uh, for, for many of you, uh, for many it may be. Um, so it's uh, a member of the orchestra or of the orchestra staff for major symphonies, operas, academic, festival, military, and ballet organizations and institutions like military bands and orchestras. Uh, performance librarians are, as a profession, concerned with providing materials to their ensembles, which allow the performers complete freedom to play the music without logistical concerns, such as wrong transpositions, wrong start and end points, bad page turns, incomplete parts, illegibly small notes or small symbols or text, parts which do not agree with the scores and so forth. In other words, a rehearsal can begin, the music works as it is. Performance librarians are sometimes the only members of a performing arts organization on staff who can read a score other than the music director. If the orchestra has a librarian, it is they who read the instrumentation page and communicate to the personnel manager, say, what players exactly are needed, what percussion instruments must be rented, for example, uh, whether or not a celeste is going to be required on this concert program. My job as a performance librarian in relation to composers and new music is to oversee the submission of new work, uh, vet the submissions for completeness by reading the instrumentation and score uh, and comparing with the materials, share metadata for each work with other staff or departments, um, so, you know, that instrumentation page at the beginning of your score, uh, the conductor is going to see that, I'm going to see it, and that that's sort of the beginning uh, of the sort of logistical story of the performance or reading of a work. At MSM, I act, uh, Manhattan School of Music, I act as an advocate and music notation mentor for the student composers during the submission process for their works. We do uh, 15 uh, premieres every year of students. Um, and ensure the original work is communicated to the performers in the clearest and most efficient way possible. At ACO, I track edits and enter changes into parts uh, if, if needed as the process moves along and the composer wants to add dynamics or whatever. Um, I continue to support the clarity and effectiveness of the performance materials. So you know, not talking about aesthetics, really just talking about the technical details. So, uh, you know, looking at uh, doing one of these ear shots, you're considering composing orchestral music, and you, you should know if you're not already, already familiar with um, the international organization which Garrett uh, uh, spoke of, MOLA. So it used to stand for Major Orchestra Librarians Association when it was founded 40 years ago as an acronym, uh, but it is no longer. Um, since now we have non-major orchestras that are, that are also a part of it. It started with uh, 13 groups. Um, do you remember? Phil? And it wasn't too many, uh, maybe less than 20. Uh, and now there are, um, I believe, over 300 organizations across the country, uh, across over the world. Um, Philip, is it, I, I, I actually am not clear if that number is exactly right. Let me check it. Don't, don't comment yet. Uh, but we do have members in Europe, the United States, Africa, the Middle East, China, Japan, Australia, all over. Um, it's the only organization in the world which supports this very niche profession, and it's at the heart of the profession. Um, so you received links to the MOLA website, 
and it helps uh, it holds very helpful information on its public pages including instructional videos and links to MOLA publications uh, what MOLA offers for composers are industry standard specs for music engraving and production, which have been created and vetted, as Garrett said, by those who stand at this intersection of new creative work and its execution by uh, orchestral musicians, soloist conductors, uh, performance librarians. So also coming in the other direction, um, librarians hear every offhand remark from musicians regarding legibility, clarity, and ease of use of the scores and parts that are in front of them. Um, and so that, you know, that offers uh, sort of a sounding board in, in the other direction, too. Uh, I served on the MOLA board for, for two years and enjoy you know, friendship with colleagues around the world. Uh, and uh, they've asked me to, to share one, one request of composers. Uh, please meet deadlines. Um, and uh, what we do if the materials come in late, they're the ones, the performance librarians who put their lives on hold to so that when the verses begin, materials are ready. It's a degree of commitment and sacrifice that's substantial. And it's partly why they've done so much to try to clarify the specifics. So um, in the link that you, uh, you received in the MOLA education page, um, I just wanted to, I'm just going to, you don't have to be following it necessarily, but I just want to summarize some things that you can find there. Um, there are resources for underrepresented composers. If you identify in one of these categories, get yourself on the list because this is a, a place where, you know, performance librarians, conductors sometimes come in and want to chat and have, you know, sort of brainstorm about how to, you know, uh, uh, add new works to, to programs. And uh, that's kind of the first place that I look are the, um, um, you know, the resources that are there. Uh, you know, conductors also uh, avail themselves of it. So, you know, if, if, um, if you belong to one of these categories, then, then make sure you're there and, and, you know, be represented. And it's, you know, it's just a great way to put yourself out there. Um, Librarians on performance librarianship, you can find out there about more about your profession. Uh, there are copyright resources, you know, always helpful uh, uh, for a composer to know about. I'm sure you already uh, have uh, have looked into this very carefully. It's also, I, I think, helpful to, to sort of look at it from the other side, too. And, um, you know, you get sort of a more rounded view. Uh, um, librarians are handing a lot of, a lot of the licensing for uh, performing arts organizations these days. Um, there are public resources links that are near the top middle of the page, which have how-to guides and the publications page. Um, and on that page, you'll find the MOLA guidelines for music preparation. And this is, a, you know, a handbook that I think has gotten around very well. It's translated it into uh, seven uh, different languages. Um, and it's really just something to have, you know, on your desk or nearby. Um, very helpful. And this is, again, just um, knowledge that has been, you know, boiled down. And exactly, thank you, uh, Philip just posted the link in chat um, to, to the essentials. Uh, there's a digital classroom, which is new, but uh, quickly expanding. And, you know, there are things like tutorials on how to do binding uh, and various other uh, um, industry standard methodologies. So uh, that's my little quick tour through MOLA. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the, um, so, so the, the uh, side of music prep that I'm going to talk about is sort of like my background here. Uh, I've got all these uh, acid-free le legal files in which are each one uh, contains a, an orchestra set for a piece that is done here at Manhattan School of Music where I have my office. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the physical materials. Um, so, uh, so Philip uh, has his scoringnotes.com page. You you got that link, um, and he offers uh, a very uh, fantastic list of um, of information there that you can absolutely uh, uh, help yourself to. Oh, and it's uh, screen shared right there. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about it's um, the area about um, what is the heading there. Uh, Production and binding. 
Yeah. And Lee, would it would it make more sense to go in order here um, to uh, go through um, how to produce it on the screen and then go to the printed materials? Is that um, what you had in mind, or do you want to start with the printed materials first? Well, you know, I I don't know. If you think feel strongly about it, I I think it's good to start with the printed materials to give context because that's where you're kind of okay. That's where you're kind of headed. Uh, but I'm not going to go straight down the. Uh, I'm not going to go straight down the page. Um, yeah, in fact, the first thing that I I want to point out is what I think is the most important element in music notation, and that is staff size. And you can see that right there. Uh, Philip has laid out some um, uh, um, measurements: parts seven millimeters to seven and a half millimeters, with good page turns planned out. That is that well you you cannot go wrong with with that size uh printed uh staff size and the score staff staff size four millimeters um if it gets much smaller than that it it really is going to be problematic okay so that's like rule that's rule number one is the staff size um i want to talk about two media for the transmission of music notation uh one is the printed music and the other is digital ipads and so forth so for the printed music, um, the great majority of orchestra musicians still play today from printed parts and scores. So these are propped up on music stands, in performance venues, large enough to hold an orchestra. That sounds obvious, but it's actually really important to keep in mind. So a standard orchestra stand is 20 inches wide by just short of 13 inches tall. And if you've looked at the MOLA published preferred music dimensions, it's 10 by 13 inches. So you've got two 10 inch wide pieces of paper and that completely fills the stand, right? And then 13 inches tall. So that's where that spec comes from. Um, if uh, the performance is taking place in a pit, uh, there's gonna be a stand light and that takes a little bit of space. So a little bit less room. Um, if the, these dimensions are greatly exceeded, the capacity for the music stand to support the part is compromised. If it's too big, it'll flop over. Um, but you do wanna keep in mind that the larger the page, page size, the more music can fit on it without turning a page. That's why really filling that music stand size is better than having smaller sheets. Um, I want to point out that landscape format, letter-sized paper, or ledger-sized paper fulfills neither of these efficiency standards. So its format is different from the music stand upon which it would rest, neither taking advantage of its dimensions or fitting widthwise, because two 11-inch pages start to flop over the edge. So I'm just going to urge you not to use this format in general. Um, it's not acceptable for orchestral use. Uh, from a mechanical perspective, both it's in terms of its function as this codex and the, you know, on the, the music stand and the interaction between the performer in it, doing page turns, if they have to reach a long way, uh, portrait format is just superior. Um, nine by 12 paper uh, format printed on 12 by 18 paper is a great compromise for composers. Orchestra musicians are used to this size, even if it is not optimal, it is uh, easy to produce and, and Philip will, will be able to speak more about that. I wanna talk about paperweight. And this is the second important point to keep in mind. Uh, again, going back to that idea of the concert hall um, with the, the big HVAC systems, you've got you know, the air conditioning, there are breezes that come up. And so it's really important for the paper not to be super lightweight. If it's regular 20 pound paper, it's, you know, it can actually, I don't know if you've ever seen a concert where they're just like, it's do it, it's just nose diving off of the music stand and the, the musicians are just trying to pat it down. Avoid that, use heavier weight paper. Um, so at minimum 24 to 28 pound laser paper, uh, using that on 12 by 18 paper printed as booklets and saddled stapled is, is a great thing that doesn't cost an arm and a leg to be able to manage. Um, in the link, you received uh, some links for paper suppliers and where to send PDFs to uh, get them printed on good paper. Um, and then I wanna talk about uh, medium number two, iPads or tablets. So uh, again, you have to keep in mind the screen size. If a musician is reading from an iPad, 
the same question of legibility applies. Like the staff size still has to be the same size on the iPad, right? Otherwise, it gets to be too small to read. Um, page turns are less of an issue if you've got a you know a pedal to turn the pages for you, um, and that's a great advantage, of course. Landscape format doesn't matter anymore because we're not talking about a music stand. It's you know it's on your iPad, but orchestras don't play. You know, orchestras do not play from these yet. And you can there are some there are a couple of um, exceptions to the rule, but uh, yeah, for for right now it's still going to be paper. Um, the last thing I wanted to touch on before passing the mic over to Philip is uh, talking about non-traditional music notation, and um, this is not on the on the MOLA website. Uh, non-traditional this runs the gamut, uh, but again. Uh, examples I've seen to date of this have been examples I've seen. In other words, they rely on a visual score, uh, which is communicated to the performers via the same print medium as traditional music notation. So whenever a printed score is involved, whether or not the printing is music notation, graphic notation, or text, printing at the same dimensions is still a good idea on the same heavier weight paper and for the same reasons. Small loose sheets can fall off of music stands. Um, all right, those are the basic pound, uh, points I wanted to cover. And you know, you can see most of them, if not all of them, on uh, uh, Philip's production and binding page here. I didn't go exactly in order, uh, but this is just a fantastic resource. And I uh, would uh, like to pass the mic now to Philip uh, uh, to, uh, to carry on. That's great. Thanks, Manly. And I think the visuals behind this are really telling because Manly has the just the shelves of of scores and physical materials, much of which is still extremely relevant in the world of performance. Because if you think about it, paper, it's instantly bootable. You know, it doesn't crash on you. It can be, you don't need a software update to read it and so on and so on and so forth. So paper is still very useful. That said, um, you know, it is a fact of life that digital materials are with us and they are used by a, a quite a lot of, especially smaller ensembles and increasingly larger ensembles as well. Uh, so that's a great point. Uh, certainly chamber musicians, jazz musicians, session musicians, it's so much easier to take that one iPad with you instead of you know, a whole truckload of fake books and uh, sheet music around the country. So I did um, send a uh, link around preparing scores for screens written by my great colleague, David McDonald. You can read up about that. Um, and uh, yes, we do talk about margins to uh, Denise, who uh, mentioned that in the chat. Basically, you don't need as much margin on an iPad as you do for paper because you have the bezels. And even if you don't have the bezels, um, but um, you know we can talk about that a little bit more. Um, just a few things I'll pick up real quickly on what Manley said before I'll kind of give you my quick uh, rundown. And you know he did mention about um, physical materials and the size. What I showed on the screen here, if you can see, this is a nine by twelve part, and it's in booklet format, meaning that it opens the way you would open a book. Um, and uh, page numbers, you can see page two and then page three. Um, page turns are a consideration, obviously. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but there's also another way of taping music or binding music, which is the you know accordion fold method. And we see this when page turns aren't very good uh, or for solo music where it's just continuous. And you might have one or two music stands put together and I'll you know, do my best. I don't know if you can see, but this is what accordion, what we talk about accordion fold looks like. And we tape the music all together like that. So um, for what that's worth, you may hear those terms um, bandied about a little bit. But in all cases, um, we print here on 9 by 12 or 18 by 12 folded over. Uh, I know that's not practical if you don't have a, a printer, but we can we can talk about those things. So, so look, what I'd like to discuss in the very brief time that we have together, this is a this is something that it's taken literally decades for me to to master, and I'm still learning things. I want to just emphasize that. I can't emphasize that enough. You know, I don't expect that you're going to internalize everything there is to know about music preparation in 35 minutes or whatever it is that we have. So the point of today's session is to point you in the right direction, to give you some resources, hopefully 
you know, this will inspire you to, to seek out more resources on your own. I'm not saying this just because it's my blog, but I really do believe that scoring notes is one of the best resources out there in this world, this intersection of music preparation and technology and music notation software and everything that it takes to get music on the screen, whether we have the information ourselves or whether we link to it, such as the MOLA guidelines, we, you know, we link to that. Obviously, MOLA is a great resource and we partner with them and we've co-presented with them before. Um, and this is what we talk about, the MOLA guidelines. You can find those links. They're in multiple languages. Uh, and it talks all about some of the most essential things. But what I'd like to do now, you know, using scoring notes, and you know, this is the this is the main page of the website. I reviewed a uh, an instrument museum that I went to, but we typically talk about music notation technology. And these are just things. This is actually again my great colleague David McDonald put this together. And I'm just going to go very quickly down the list. If if you have limited amount of time and you really want to at least see if you can knock out some of the major pitfalls that um, befall a lot of composers preparing their own music. Here are the things that you want to know, you want to find out. First of all, rehearsal marks. You got to have them, okay? The only exception is maybe if it's a solo piece where it's just one player and they always know where they are. Um, but what are we talking about? We're talking about rehearsal marks where, you know, a big box with either a letter or a number uh, in it so that the, the conductor can say very clearly, let's start start at bar 17, bar 28, or rehearsal A, rehearsal B. You know, there are various reasons why you would want rehearsal letters or, or numbers. Typically, I like to see in concert music, you know, the bar number because it's just there's no confusion. So bar 17 is always 17. David says he likes to, you know, put rehearsal marks enough so that you know the conductor doesn't have to flip one page in either direction to get to one. And I think in this example that I'm showing you, uh, that is the case. By the way, all, I know this session is being streamed and live. You know, the music that's shown on the screen is really for educational purposes only. Um, so I just wanna make sure that we put that out there and it's not used for any other purpose. But um, if you're preparing music, a lot of people prepare session music. I know you're not, you know, you're probably just not gonna create concert music. Here's an example of a, um, of, a, of a jazz piece where we used rehearsal letters. Why did we do that? Because in when you're recording, doing a recording, this is a recording session, it's much easier for the person doing the Pro Tools to, to drop markers in the middle of the session, rehearsal, you know, D, E, F, G, H, and they can just do that very quickly in the software. Not to mention it's more customary. Where do we see them, especially in music with regular form, where the phrases are typically, and that is at the start of a, we really try to lay things out if it's a regular four bar phrase or an eight bar phrase, if we can do it at the start of a bar line. This makes it so much easier to find your way in a, in a piece. I can't tell you the number of pieces I've seen where the music is just like whatever the default in the software was, and it makes no musical sense. With concert music, of course, that's not always the case. You're going to have irregular uh, phrases and five bars and eight, seven bars and five, four and six, eight and all that sort of stuff. But when you can, this, this, this gives you a glance really quickly at the form of the piece. And one other thing that I will mention, you know, on, on that point, I'll, I'll show another uh, piece, um, again, another jazz piece. You can see here, this is a four, you can see Sibelius, Finale, Dorico. They all do this where you can see what the layout of the music will be. Um, and I see some raised hands. We will get to that um, in a little while. Thank you, if you can just hold the thought. Um, and this is a, a where you have a DS Alcoda. Again, not so common in concert music, very common in jazz music, session music. Again, it's very easy. You see the DS here. You see the coda sign here. And so this two-page spread is just very easy for the drummer to know where they are. So that's one of the things that we talk about, rehearsal marks. Cues, what do we mean by cues? Basically, when a player is resting for a certain amount of time, they need a visual indication of when to come back in based on what other music is going on in the piece. And typically, you know, that takes the form of a, you know, you know, you can see here, here's one example. Uh, the, these are, this is, this is actually 
fairly complicated music. So we see, you know, okay, the second flute is playing. Now the third flute is playing. Now the second flute, it's all labeled. Maybe a more um, typical example, if I can find one here, uh, let's find, yeah, here's, here's one for instance, the oboe uh, part. So we have some rests, then the English horn plays small notation with rests indicated. So there's no confusion that it's still a rest. And then the player enters. Again, we would also very commonly see it after a long period of rest, four bars, 12 bars. So 16 total bars, new piece, contemporary music, the player might lose count. You know, here's an obvious example that they'll hear. The violo solo is playing, followed by the violin one. Bop, 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 bop. Ah, now it's time to play. So if I miscounted by a bar, you know, I'll get right back on track. So cues are very important. And I want to just say on that point, um, another reference that I cannot recommend highly enough, if there's one book, you know, on your desk or on your virtual shelf that you should get, it's, uh, it's Eileen Gould's Behind Bars. And you can get it on Kindle format. You can get it. I have it on, you know, iBooks right here. You can get it in a regular printed bound copy. She talks all about what the, I mean, it, if you have a question about music preparation, it's in there and she covers it. So Behind Bars by Elaine Gould. I cannot recommend that highly enough. Um, so, and I think I even uh, have a link to that. I'm sure many of you have that already. This is just, this happens to be the uh, the Amazon link, but you know I'm not necessarily recommending or not recommending Amazon, but um, you can find it there in a variety of formats. Okay, moving you know right on down the line. Redundancies again. This is very typical or common to do. Easy to do this in uh, Sibelius, especially, but all the programs. You know, if you have a redundant meter, a key signature, an instrument change, you want to check to make sure that you haven't said, you know. For instance, consordino twice in a row, because the player might say, well, wait a second, did I miss a senza sordino somewhere down the line? There are some automated tools the various software packages have to check. Another thing that's common to do, especially if you're copying and pasting in Sibelius, is to do one of these, you know, jobs where, you know, it's like, oh, I put in a two, four, here's a two, the, the conductor might say, let's start at the two, four bar. And, it, and it's like, which two, four bar? There's two of them. So that uh, is something that I see a lot. I also actually happen to see the wrong time signature. That's actually surprisingly easy to do. So you want to check for, uh, for that sort of stuff as well. So those are some of the things when we talk about redundancies. Um, so let's see, just moving on down the line. Obviously, collisions, near collisions, this is very typical, you know, common stuff, the programs. It's a lot harder to do this because they all have some sort of collision avoidance. But, um, you know, diff, you know what, what are we talking about? I'll, I'm even going to try to do it. See, the, the dynamic is repelling the staff. But if it collided into it, you know, if I turned off magnetic layout and I had something like that, you know, it'd be hard to tell what note is that, what's going on. So, you know, obviously a good, a good thorough proofread com, com, um, combined with, you know, getting the settings right in the software. In Sibelius, it's under your magnetic layout settings. Dorico has a whole host of settings. Finale, less so in this regard, but still with some of the automated features in, in Finale, you can get there. And so you want to, you know, let the let the software work for you and not the other way around. That's what I always like to say. Um, and you'll you can prevent a lot of those those things from from popping up. Um, let's see. So here's one that I see a lot and. This is very, very important, whether or not to indicate, you know, transposed or sounding pitch in the score. What I mean by sounding pitch a C score, right? Concert pitch, sounding pitch. So transposed, obviously the music is transposed, meaning the transposing instruments are transposed into the same, um, you know, key that that the, the player would, would read them in. B flat is transposed up a major second. F horns are transposed up a perfect fifth and so on and so forth. Especially important if, it, as is the case with this particular example, you know, there's no key signature. So it's, you know, it's not quite, this music isn't quite atonal, but there's no key signature. And so looking at it very quickly, unless I had this, thankfully I have that, transpose, you can say transposed score, score slash transposed or in brackets, whatever, as long as it's there, that's fine. And that way the conductor 
And anyone score reading can easily know that, ah, yes, this isn't supposed to be a second apart. These two parts are actually playing in unison. And it's just that the B flat clarinet is written up a step from where the oboe is. That's very important. You know, um, sometimes we don't see it and it's okay to get away with not putting that in, in a score like here's a piece overture in a classical style and literally it has key signatures like a classical music piece. That's very obvious, obviously, you know, two sharps for the clarinets and one sharp for the horns and, and so on. So we can actually tell at a glance that it's transposed. Probably wouldn't have hurt still to put transpose score. There's no harm there, but little, um, you know, not as not as important. One thing that I will mention though, and again, this is something very specific to music notation software, getting, going back to that piece for a second. Often I will see when composers compose in sounding pitch in, you know, in C. So basically in Sibelius, I'm just, you know, for ease of presentation, I'm using Sibelius here. You know, we have transposing score off, okay? And you see the, the notes changed. Now you notice, that the key signature did not change because I have chosen atonal key, okay? And this is called keyless mode or atonal key or open key. Every one of the software programs calls, uh, calls it a little bit differently, but it is common. And I think even the default, if I created a new score in, in um, Sibelius, let's just try this, you know, I'm almost certain of it. If I created a wind quintet, using their stock wind template, okay? Um, and now transposing score is off. So I'm composing away and all that and so on and so forth. And I'm putting notes in. And then, you know, I give this to the performer and what do they see? They see two sharps, but I didn't intend for there to be, you know, I didn't intend for this, this piece to be in a key. And so what does that mean? Every time, that you know, there's an F, uh, if I intend for an F natural like here, oh, sorry. So that would be like an, like an E flat, a written E flat. You know, they, they see an F natural, they've canceled out a key signature, which I don't even intend to be there in the first place. That, caught, that is a very, 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 very common error. And it's because of the defaults in the software. So how to fix that? Very simple. In your program of choice, make sure that you go to the key signature area. In this case, it's no notations or just hit K. Choose a tonal key, click in the Sibelius, you click to the left. Nothing happened because remember, this is a not a, you know, this is a concert score, transposing score is off. But in the clarinet part, now it's transposed up a major second, but there's no weird F natural canceling out a key signature. I cannot stress that enough. I see it all the time. Like all the time. So that's important. Um, and we have links uh, here, I think somewhere along the line, we talk about keyless. Uh, it's at, yeah, it's actually uh, down here, but it, uh, going keyless in your score, I need to update this for Adorico, obviously, but you can find the links uh, on, this, on this page. We talk specifically how to do that in the software. Okay, real quickly here, um, as we kind of go down the list, now we talk about layouts. Page turns, system breaks. We, you know, you might want to uh, adjust the page justification settings. What do I mean by this? Care, you know, or what does David mean by this? Careful with page turns and 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 system breaks. Here's an example. Let me go back to the. Um, well, let's just use this as an example. And um, hopefully, this is well laid out. So, page turns. You always want to have. I think. Elaine Gould recommends a minimum of four seconds at whatever tempo that you're at. So that could be as little as one bar, maybe. If the tempo is really slow, like quarter note equals 60, you can probably get away with a one bar rest when you need to turn the page. And what do I mean by turning the page? Obviously flipping the page over from page three to page four. At a faster tempo, you might need several bars. Uh, you can probably get away with it a little less if the music is you know, really tight. In this particular case, what I've done to kind of balance out the layout, even though I probably could have done a page turn at the beginning, you know, somewhere on page one, I've actually made a separate title page to get a nice two page spread. So when the player opens up, um, yeah, this is actually a good example. I, I, this, is, this is what I'm talking about in real life. Stop sharing my screen for a moment. 
this is a two, this is, this piece is just two pages long. So, you know, when I open up in regular, you know, form, I've got a nice two page piece of music here that lays out very, very nicely. I know librarians like to see that as opposed to music that opens up the other way, because, you know, it's just, it's, it's a lot e easier to, you know, you, you expect this as opposed to opening up the other way around. And so that's what we talk about when we're talking about, you know, page turns, making sure that there's enough uh, time for them and so on and so forth and get to the screen again. And so you can see here, there's enough rest here. Um, it's a little tight, but, you know, we are in four, four uh, so we're in two, four. Um, so it's, 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 you know, probably, this probably would have been a better page turn now that I look at the six bars of rest instead of three bars. But, you know, sometimes we had, we, we really had to make sure that we fit all the music on the next two pages and didn't overcrowd it. So there were a lot of considerations at play. But the nice thing is that's the end of the movement. Now we have a nice two page spread for the second movement. That's nice and easily spaced. And then the third page, the third movement rather, that's just a one page part. Again, this symbol is universally acknowledged as saying, turn the page. You could also say this page is blank for page turns, but that's more wordy. Maybe your you know, player doesn't speak English. And then we have um, the, you know, the fourth movement again, on a two page spread. So the whole thing lays out very, very nicely. Basically when you open up, you're basically looking at an entire movement or a good uh, portion of it. So there's a lot of thought given to, you know, when you prepare music, how is the player gonna react? Can they keep the music open on their page? Do they have to be turning pages back and forth? One thing that you'll notice is that we I tried as best I could to kind of equally space the music on facing pages. That's just aesthetically nicer instead of cramming, you know, 10 staves on one and six on the other, try to balance it out as best I could. Sometimes that's not always possible. So that's what we're talking about there. Um, that's what, and, and so we actually say that, try to keep system and staff spacing consistent. So um, one, a couple other things as we go down the list, again, talking about MOLA, they say, do not create wind parts with multiple instruments on a single staff. Um, for instance, flutes one and two should be on separate parts. So with that in mind, let me just show you, let me go back to that overture in classical style. So for the score, it's perfectly fine, especially a piece that's in classical style like this. It's easier for the score reader to see both uh, parts on one staff. But for the player, you can't give them to that, give it, give it to that, them like that. It's very difficult to read, especially when you get to things like this where they're divided and all that. Very clear for the conductor what's going on. So what do you have to do? You have to split out separate parts. And in Sibelius, they have this, you know, fairly recent feature in the last couple of years, focus on staves. I've actually kept everything in one file and I've only switched on in the score the staves that I want to show, but then I have other sta other staves that aren't showing in the score. And you can see that by the blue dotted line that are for the parts. If I go to my panorama view here, you'll see every single staff that's in the file, but only some of those are actually in the score. You can see, so these are my individual, individually split out flutes, one and two staves. And so this is what an individual flute part looks like. So only one player you know, much easier to read than having both on one uh, staff, on, uh, on one staff. So, you know, look, again, this is not the time to go into detail about how to set this up technically speaking, but it is possible. And uh, you can see here, this is a really good example of, of how that's done. And by the way, I'll just, um, you know, uh, uh, emphasis this is a great actually segue into the next point. Do not create a separate file for each part. I think if you're using software these days, it used to be way back like when Manly and I started out, you would have to extract a separate flute one part and a flute two, you know, these were like 30 separate finale files. And if you wanted to change the tempo in one from like quarter note equals 100 to a quarter note equals 101, you'd had to open up 30 separate files. You don't have to do that anymore because we're using linked parts. And this is actually one file that has all the score and parts. So if I wanted to change the tempo here to 144 because the composer wanted to take it a little slower, no problem. It's automatically updated, you know, right away in all the parts and just like that. So worst case scenario, if the music is incredibly complicated and you can't fit it all in one file, sometimes it is better 
to do a separate parts file and a separate score file. But at most, you'll, you'll have two files. Like here's a score. This is a like a pops show. And for a variety of reasons, I just did the score in one file. And you see here, there's actually no linked parts, you can see. But then what I did separately was a separate parts file uh, right here. And here I wasn't, what, what's, what's nice with that is that you don't have to be concerned with what the score looks like. You can see here, I start having collisions and things don't quite look right in the score. Um, but I don't care about that at that point because I'm only using it for parts. And sometimes that's a little, you know, though it, it's easier in that you still only have two files to manage instead of 30. So uh, real quickly, I know we have, uh, you know, we're supposed to stop for a break very shortly. The one last thing that I'll, I'll just mention is uh, the, the front matter and mainly emphasize a very, very important part, point about librarians, you know, that front matter is so important. And keep in mind, not every orchestra has a librarian. It may be a personnel manager. It may be even someone that doesn't really read music um, that is responsible for procuring the music. And so they not, may not be able to tell from the score easily what the instrumentation is. You know, say your personal, personnel manager needs to know who do I hire for this? Or the stage manager needs to know what percussion instruments do I need to uh, uh, you know, put on the stage? This is where the front matter is really important. If you don't have front matter for an orchestra piece, you need to have it. Uh, you know, David has says, do not try doing this in your scoring app. It will almost certainly end in tears. I mean, what he's basically saying is that, you know, the scoring applications are not word processing or graphics programs and vice versa. So that being said, I have sometimes tried to do it in music notation software. And with a little bit of finagling, you can, you can do it. Like this is all in Sibelius. Okay, and it, it it was painful to try to do this, but I did it. Um, and at the end of the day, however you do it, what's what has to be here? Instrumentation, how many of each instrument, you know, what instrument they're doubling on, um, and percussion, what the list of percussion instruments is. Uh, certainly the duration of the piece is always very helpful. This has some other elements like a cast and speaking parts. Um, if there's any libretto, uh, that's very, very important. Here's um, Here, I'll give an example of um, another piece that has this. This is where I did do this in, I think, Word or, or some other program. And uh, obviously, any commissioning information is good. Uh, here's a percussion key that's, you know, nice to have. Um, and then program notes, performance notes, especially if there's anything in, in you know, uh, unusual or non-traditional. This explains what's supposed to happen. And here's the libretto right there, you know, in more or less a format that you'd be accustomed to seeing in, in, in any sort of text uh, reference doc, uh, document. Um, in, in this particular piece, so just to prove the point, this is actually a Microsoft Word document, uh, another piece, same deal. This is one, there are four, I showed you different movements so you can actually see. Wouldn't have hurt actually to put the page numbers with the, you know, I didn't do that here, but I could have said the poet starts on page 34 so the conductor could easily turn to it. That would have been nice, but uh, at least it's there. Instrumentation, again, same deal. You know, what the doubling instruments are, how many players, what the, what the list of percussion is, and so on down the line. So- Can I- uh... Yeah. Can I yeah, just yeah. quickly chime in about the instrumentation list there? Please. Because this is something that uh, that I see, um, and you know, as, as Philip mentioned, as I, I mentioned earlier, this page is very important, and it tells the orchestra what's needed, right? Yep. It's not the place to get stylish with the way that you indicate what is needed. This is the place where it needs to be absolutely clear. The example that Philip has here is absolutely clear. Two flutes, second doubles on piccolo. I've seen things like two flutes and a plus piccolo on that line. Mm -hmm. And does that mean it's a third player or is that a piccolo double? Um, other other sort of you know means of shorthand. I mean, you'll see them in the scores that you study that maybe splendid, fantastic scores. But this front matter, I urge you to just take it real simple. And and what uh, what there is, there, you can't uh, what what's on the page that uh, Philip is showing right now. 
you can't read it any other way and that's what you need thank you yep and i know uh, garrett wants to jump in there and i will just uh the last point i'll make again is uh on just to show this example the first page of music in the score should also show all of the instruments that are playing including their doubling and hopefully it <laughs> matches i'm I'm hopeful that it does, um, you know, the instrumentation page that I'm showing. But you here you see the the instrumentation, and here you see the first page of music of the score. And sure enough, I can go on down the line, flute one, flute two, slash piccolo. And then the first entrance of that player should be marked. This is actually very important. You know, any doubling instrument has to be marked with, you know, one or the other, which one there's in this case, they, they start on flute and not piccolo. Later, they go to piccolo. Same thing with the oboe. The first system shows both instruments, and then the beginning of the next system shows what instrument they are playing. And then later on, you'll see an indication for them to change. And you can see on down the line, it basically maps uh, it, you know, exactly. The only thing is with percussion, sometimes it's difficult to, sh to list all the percussion instruments at the start of the score. The part, you can see it's hidden there, but in the part, and again, so many things to talk about here. Percussion part, especially if it's in score format like this, meaning all the percussion instruments are in one part, has to have the entirety of the percussion instrumentation right at the top of the score. They shouldn't have to hunt through the whole score to find out what instruments they need to grab for that first rehearsal. Should all be there, ideally in alphabetical order, just because that's easy. Okay, Garrett. Yes, thank you. Thank you both so much for sure. uh, such useful information. There is one hand up. I'm going to uh, allow sure. you to uh, speak. But while it's fresh on my mind when we're talking about the instrument switches, I wonder if uh, briefly uh, you have any guidance on advance notice, especially for instruments like bassoon, contrabassoon that may take a few bars to negotiate and to put back on the stand. Yeah, uh, more more is better. More time is better. <laughs> yeah, so the typical way of doing that would be the last note that you play. Say you're playing bassoon and you're going to switch to contra. Yeah, and you've you've got a rest in between. Well, you're going to have to have a rest in between. Right. <laughs> the the after the last note, and I'm talking about after in time spacing. So, you know, yeah. beyond the right. note in time spacing to contra. And then when it gets to example, contra yeah. before the first note that is played in time spacing before the first note on contra, contra. And this is this is exactly the example. I think this illustrates precisely what you're saying, except that we're talking about oboe and English horn here. So you can see here, uh, here is the last note that the oboe two plays. Then I didn't have you know it would have hung over the end of the system here. So here it's on the next system, but it says two English horn right here. And then in big, bold, and boxed says English horn. You can't miss it. And so that's what Manly is talking about there. And then same thing again here. Last note says two oboe. And then here, oboe. That's how you right. do it. And, right. and by the way, also, uh, as soon as that happens, basically, if it's a transposing, which this, this is, you know, transp transposition changes. Remember, there's no key signature here, so we don't see a key signature change. But immediately, any cues are going to be in the key of the next, you know, the next instrument. So basically, this this cue is in the key of C. It's not transposed anymore. But if I had a cue that was for English horn, uh, if I if I was still being on, you know, the reverse was happening. If I was moving to English horn, I would transpose this key this uh, cue into the key of the English horn up a up a fifth. Great, thank yep. you. Sure, uh, Denise. I know that you had your hand raised. If you're uh, able, please uh, offer whatever question you have. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Great. Hey, um, really enjoying this. So the um, score you showed, uh, the LES score, mm -hmm. the numbers at the bottom, and it just looks completely unnecessary and noisy to me. And then I saw in the part that it also had every measure numbered. Is mm -hmm. this the, was that it looks like that might have just been the percussion part, but um, is that really uh, preferred? I can give you uh, my perspective and Manly, feel free to uh, chime in. So, look, you know, this is one of the things that um, bar numbers, you know, it used to be the case in concert music where you didn't number every bar because uh, it was just very 
time consuming, you know, and if you inserted a bar here or there, you'd have to renumber all the bars and all of that. Um, and in like classical, you know, literally talking about like classical music, Beethoven, etc. It's unusual to see that you might just see a rehearsal mark. Now, I see no downside, really, like it's the reason I put it at the very bottom is to avoid that noise that you mentioned, like it is out of the way. It's it's not really, you know, it's not obscuring the music. It's not getting in the way of anything. But, you know, if a composer or a conductor wants to reference a bar really quickly, they don't have to go like six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you know, count. They can just see, ah, there it is, bar 11. I see it. And the software automatically does it. If you're composing, if you're inserting bars, it automatically renumbers. For, con for concert music, you're right. In the part, it can get rather noisy. And that's why in concert music, I typically don't do it. I do put it on, I do put the ranges, um, you know, the bar numbers on the multi-rest range, because again, I see no downside, like, you know, some the bar, the conductor for whatever reason calls out bar 42. It's just easier to find your way if you know that that's in the 39 to 45 range. Context, is, yeah. context is one of the, the major uh, uh, reasons why one would add uh, measure numbers to every single bar as opposed to only once per system, right? Like if it's a recording session and time is absolutely of the, yep. of the essence and the music may not have too much going on underneath it, then there's absolutely no reason not to include the, the bar numbers because then the musicians, you know, can find the bar immediately. Yeah. Um, this is an example. Very... Just sorry to interrupt. This is oh. so to that point. This is a this is that session music that I talked about where we it is very customary in film, in session music, jazz music to to num number every bar like that. Like exactly. Said. And the, the same with like pops music or music pops theater music. music. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, a lot of it is is traditionally done every single bar because it's, you know, it's just like the notes and there isn't, you know, a, a whole lot of sort of sound of piano crescendo and, you know, things going on uh, right. above or anything. So, yeah, this is, a, but if there is, then, no, then once per system is, is going to be enough. Yep. Very good question. And, um, you know, to that point, this is like a high, this is almost like a pops theater thing all um, rolled into one, this particular thing. And you will see, even though it's orchestral music, somewhat concert music, we did number every bar because they had basically like one rehearsal to do it. And, um, you know, that was it. So, so yeah, care is needed, obviously, to make sure that they don't collide with other elements. And you may, it may mean that dynamics are a little farther away, like they are here from the staff than they ordinarily would be. Those are compromises you do have to make. So um, it all depends, as Manly said, on context. Great, great. There is one uh, question in the chat. Uh, the two of you did briefly uh, mention digital scores and digital parts. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, are there major differences or major considerations when preparing a score or parts specifically for uh, an iPad reading or some other digital device? I think the answer is yes. And the reason is because uh, the the screen size of the iPad is smaller than this, you know, it's not nine by 12, it's not 10 by 13. It's, I don't know, Phil, if you know better than me what the exact size would be, but it's, yeah. it's just smaller. And so if you have set up your, uh, you know, um, uh, in your software for seven millimeter staff size, and then it shrinks automatically when it's on the iPad screen, then you don't have a seven millimeter size anymore. So yeah. if you're going to be, if you know that your performers are using iPads, uh, and they're going to be, you know, using it at a certain distance. You know, you have to think about these things. Is it going to be that far, the same distance away? Um, then it needs to be bigger. Uh, yeah. If it's something, some situation where they're going to have it, you know, in front of some theater pace or something where it's really going to be close, then maybe it doesn't need to be so big. But I'll tell, I'll tell you my secret tip on that, or not so secret, because I think it's all in scoring notes. But uh, um, you know, I think I, whenever possible. Um, whoops, I just lost this here. So this is, so this is a, uh, um, you know, this is the piece I try to format for more or less around 7.5 millimeters. If I'm doing nine by 12, I hear this is 7.4, but it's pretty close. You can see the page size. You can see that on your screen. It's nine by 12. You know, we, you know, American, we, you know, we measure in inches, but then when we talk about staff sizes, we almost always measure in millimeters, 7.4. What that means is that, okay, I'm kind of, hedging my bets. If the if a practice part is printed or someone isn't printing on 9 by 12 because, you know, they have a, just a regular printer that prints letter, if it's shrunk down 6, 7%, whatever, 
the staff size will still be readable enough at that it'll be like 6.8 to 6.97, still be okay. If it's blown up to 10 by 13, which might happen in a professional printing orchestra, it won't look, look absurdly large. And even if it's shrunk on the iPad, because of the resolution of the iPad is really good and you you can usually crop those margins. So you're you kind of more or less are getting this more or less the same as a letter size piece of paper. It won't be um, too small. So that sweet spot that I almost always format for is around the 7.4, 7.5 on nine by 12. And that way it has little wiggle room either way. Great. Well, yeah. unfortunately, we're out of time, but uh, thank you both so much for uh, facilitating this webinar. I know that there's been all sorts of uh, information that has been just so valuable to everyone here. Thank you so much for uh, sharing all of your knowledge with us today. Sure. Uh, our pleasure. Kevin, it's not that important to fill the last page. Don't don't fill out the page three systems, you know, and uh, because you don't want your eye to Space, you know, have to jump. Just have three systems nicely at the top of the page. No problem. It was That's a really it. great pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much for having me. Thanks a lot. Yep. Great. Well, I'll invite you both to uh, close your cameras if you okay. <laughs> if yeah, you like. You uh, and the, so everyone in the chat, I have uh, posted a couple of times a link to um, a survey. We would greatly appreciate uh, your feedback uh, following this webinar. Uh, and I'd also love to welcome you back on February 1st at 4.30 p.m. Eastern for our orchestration workshop, Tricks of the Trade, facilitated by composer, ACO board member, and earshot mentor, Mindy Wagner. We're very excited about that. Another huge thanks to our earshot partners, the American Composer, Composers Forum, New Music USA, and the League of American Orchestras. We're very grateful to the many individuals and organizations who have made Earshot possible through their support and to ACO's artists, staff, and board for making this program a reality. For more information on Earshot, including how you can apply as a composer or connect with us to bring the programs to your orchestra, as well as a full list of our other supporters, please visit AmericanComposers.org. Thank you so much once again for joining us today, and we'll see you next time.